Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Matt McNair, President of the OHSU Foundation. I am pleased to welcome you to today's discussion about health equity. COVID-19 has exposed the extent to which many groups are disproportionately affected by the virus and by many other elements of our health system. So we want to talk today about what health equity means to OHSU and why it is important to the health of Oregonians. The existence of health disparities in America is a simple fact, and OHSU can and should be a leader in reducing health inequity. Our health system must work for everyone. To make health equity a reality rather than an aspiration, we must understand the barriers faced by different communities, whether those barriers impact people due to race, age, geography, or some other reason. Structural racism, which refers to a system of policies and practices that perpetuate racial inequality, even if they appear to be race neutral, is a factor that cannot be ignored. Increasing awareness of these issues is not about assigning blame, but understanding cause and effect so that our health system can work for everyone. It is humbling to speak in advance of several leaders that are experts on the health and economic impacts of health disparities. Even for those of us that may not personally be challenged by the barriers discussed today, it is in all of our interest to understand these issues and help make our health system available to all Oregonians. Our system will never be perfect, but we can all work to make it better every day. To help us deepen our understanding of this important issue, we've invited an incredible lineup of presenters. Dr. Frank Franklin is Principal Epidemiologist for the Multnomah County Health Department and a faculty member in OHSU's Division of Epidemiology and the OHSU-PSU School of Public Health. Kate Wells is Director of Wellness and Community Health Strategy at Pacific Source Health Plans and is co-chair of the Oregon Health Authority's Committee on Health Equity. Rukaya Adams is Chief Investment Officer of Meyer Memorial Trust and a member of the OHSU Foundation Board of Trustees. Thank you all for taking time to be here with us today and for your support of our mission to help improve the health of all Oregonians. I'd like to thank all of the audience members who submitted questions to our panelists in advance. The panelists will respond to your questions in the second half of today's program. Now, we will begin with an introduction from OHSU President, Dr. Danny Jacobs. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the first in a series of planned discussions about health equity. As a child growing up in rural, segregated Arkansas in the late 50s and 60s, it always seemed to me that something was not quite right. There were places where we could not live, stores where we could not shop, areas where we could not visit, parks and swimming pools where we as black people were not allowed, and some schools we could not attend. These were all things that were taught to me by my parents, grandparents, and others along with the admonition that any and all interactions with the police were to be avoided at all costs and that places where we could safely access health care were limited. So health care inequities are not new, but the terrible events we are facing this year are magnifying their presence and opening more hearts and minds to their existence. I'd like to take a moment to outline why health inequity is such a crisis, what I believe OHSU's role should be, and how this should fit into our mission, vision, and values. I know I am not alone. You've likely heard that COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting people of color. For example, the Latinx Hispanic community makes up approximately 13% of our population, but accounts for approximately 40% of positive tests in Oregon. Likewise, George Floyd's death is yet another example of black people being disproportionately affected by some interactions with law enforcement. These two situations have placed a glaring hot spotlight on something we've long known to be true. Existing conditions and social determinants negatively impact the health and well-being of people of color and other marginalized communities. Research clearly shows that black, indigenous, and people of color suffer from chronic illnesses such as diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease at higher rates than other groups of people. Why is that? When we dig down to examine the reason for inequities, we find structural racism as a foundational root cause. We have the opportunity to recognize an important difference between individual and structural racism, therefore. Individual racism is what most people typically think of when they hear the word racism, 
a person's prejudice based on their beliefs and biases about those from a different race or culture. Structural racism, on the other hand, isn't always as obvious. It's the underlying policies, procedures, laws, and systems of our society that disadvantage people of color. It's embedded so deeply into our lives and our country's history that many don't even realize how it reveals itself or is manifested. Structural racism influences where we live, where we work, what we eat, what activities we participate in, and the resources available to us. And these factors all have a direct impact on health. At OJSU, we are a community of healers. As such, it is our mission to support the health and well being of all Oregonians. When people are ill, disabled, dying, or experiencing other mental, physical, or emotional health problems, we have a duty and responsibility to identify the causes and work to correct them like never before. That includes structural racism and the impact it has on the health of Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Hispanic, other people of color, as well as our, L as well as our LGBTQ communities. So I believe it is up to organizations like OHSU to take on this essential work, and it starts from within. We must hold the mirror up to ourselves and address these very issues that have gone on for far too long. As Ibram X. Kendi has said, and I quote, the only way to undo racism is to consistently identify and describe it and then dismantle it, close quote. Indeed, simply denouncing racism is no longer sufficient. We must be actively anti-racist to affect the change that is needed. This panel discussion is one of many important discussions and hearings occurring throughout OHSU as part of our journey towards becoming an anti-racist institution. We're pleased to co-host today's program with the OHSU Foundation as the first in this new monthly series on health equity. Future Symposia will also be hosted by OHSU, where the objective is to amplify existing OHSU programs, including those partnerships that help meet the needs of our marginalized communities. Today's panel discussion will be an introduction to the topic of health equity. Our moderators are two OHSU leaders in this field, and so I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Derek Duvivier, Assistant Professor of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine, and OHSU's Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We're also pleased to welcome Dr. Jennifer DeVoe, Chair of OHSU's number one ranked Department of Family Medicine and a nationally recognized expert on policies that improve the health of families. So I thank you all for attending and I hope you continue to join us in these important discussions as we take action to address racism and eliminate health inequities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacobs, and thank you to our panelists for joining us today. As Dr. Jacobs said, I'm Dr. Jennifer DeVoe. I have the privilege to serve as the chair of OHSU's top-ranked family medicine department. When I was a medical student, I was perplexed by how often I heard from my professors that the U.S. has the best healthcare system in the world. Yet, despite our amazing healthcare system, our country has some of the largest health equity gaps. People in the U.S. live shorter lives in poorer health than people in many other countries. After the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine released their report entitled Shorter Lives, Poorer Health, another committee was assembled by the academies to make recommendations for how to align science, practice, and policy to advance health equity. I had the great honor to serve as the chair of this committee of doctors, educators, scientists, and policymakers at the National Academies. Last year, while chairing this committee, it was a very humbling experience and I learned so much. For one, among a group of health equity experts, we had a very difficult time agreeing on the definition of health equity. One very helpful starting point was the differentiation between equality and equity, which are terms that are often used synonymously, but they have very different meanings. 
if you can see the slide on the screen right now, you'll see that there's one um, group of children where they're all receiving the same resource. And this is representative of equality. For example, all Medicaid beneficiaries get essentially the same benefit package. But we know that one size fits all approach does not work for everyone. So you'll see there's a person on the left that does not need a box, but gets one anyway. There's one in the middle who got what he needed. And there's one on the right still unable to see over the fence. In the middle, there's a group of children still looking over a fence where you see equity. And health equity is a state in which everyone has the opportunity and the resources available to attain their full health potential. And no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or any other socially defined circumstances. And then we ask, why is there a fence there? So on the far right of this picture, you'll see these children and you'll see the fence removed. This structural barrier has been dismantled so that all people can see through it and see where they need to go. Dis dismantling structural barriers such as structural racism is critically important to ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity to be healthy. This is justice. So one other point about this National Academies report, and yes, it is 600 pages long, only 60 pages. So 10% of this report is about healthcare. While healthcare teams see many of the health inequities in our society, we are very far downstream in addressing them. Our role as healthcare providers, educators, and researchers here at OHSU is to work upstream to follow the lead of many community leaders, such as our panelists today, and other community organizations working across our state to improve the health and well-being of all Oregonians. OHSU is proud to serve Oregon by offering state-of-the-art treatments and innovative curative approaches to rare and common diseases, but we also have a duty and responsibility to address the underlying causes of adverse health outcomes, including structural racism. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. De Vivier, who's going to provide some additional information about the state's definition of health equity. Thank you, Dr. DeVoe. Thank you. My name is Derek De Vivier, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Oregon has a definition of health equity that states in part, health equity is when all people can reach their full health potential and well-being and are not disadvantaged by their race, ethnicity, language, disability, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, social class, intersections among these communities or identities, or other socially determined circumstances. As we discuss health equity, I believe it is important to remember the stories behind this work stories that surround us, stories that often go untold. Ultimately, this is why we are here, people. I would like to take a minute to share with you what is unfortunately an all too familiar story. It is the story of a black man, a young husband, a loving father of five, struggling with mental health issues his entire adult life and unable to receive adequate care. This is a health disparity all too familiar to too many. One evening, he experienced a mental health crisis that led to a confrontation with police and his death. Tragically, we have heard this story all too often over the past months, and many would take issue with these events being characterized as new. And they would be right, because this story happened 50 years ago. It shows that for many in our communities, very little has changed over half a century. That loving husband and father of five was my father. And that is why we are here today, to help combat systemic racism and the barriers that it creates to achieving health equity. It is the lack of health equity that has impacted my life, the lives of my family members, and members of our communities of color to this day. And so we are here, resolute in our battle against health disparities. Our goal, 
Our goal is to make sure that 50 years from now, there is not another friend, colleague, neighbor, patient, or citizen of Oregon retelling a similar story. Now, I'd like to turn it over to our panelists. The first, Dr. Franklin, is the primary epidemiologist for Multnomah County. Dr. Franklin, you've seen firsthand how the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed health inequities in our society. What are some lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? Dr. Duvivier, thank you so much for that question. Um, and it, it's, it's pertinent given these times um, we're dealing with and managing the COVID-19 pandemic. I think um, when you think about the COVID-19 pandemic, not only has it made a showing or underscored the disproportionate impact among the black, the brown, and the poor people in our nation, in our communities, in our neighborhoods. It also has shown us that we as a country have made a consistent um, underinvestment or disinvestment into the public health infrastructure or into those systems in general that support um, removing or challenging inequities globally speaking. But particularly as we speak or look at and consider the healthcare system, there has been an ongoing disinvestment in some of these structures that would um, support um, the pandemic as we know it. And you look back in history and time, so we've squandered this opportunity to invest in these systems um, over and over again. You look back to the heroin epidemic in the 1960s in urban cities like Baltimore, Maryland, New York, you also look at the HIV epidemic in the 1970s and 80s, and then the crack epidemic in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Um, there was nothing really um, done to support those systems and treat the issue at hand in terms of um, not only the medical or the clinical issues, but the social institutions that help support these um, events in time. Um, so when we approach situations like the um, opioid epidemic that we're now still managing, if there had been investments in some of those systems or in some of those um, neighborhoods at that time, we would have been probably more prepared to deal with issues such as the opioid epidemic. So the COVID-19 sort of, to me, sort of brings up this idea that we continue and we have not learned the lessons from the last 40 or 50 years, or probably more. And it disavows us of this notion that affliction is limited to a particular race, a particular group, or a particular ideology. Um, I think the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as those, those pandemics, if you will, that I've mentioned, historically speaking, um, inevitably they wind up impacting all individuals, not just the other group. So uh, affliction doesn't have a boundary and we can no longer continue to sort of um, waste or squander the opportunity um, to support and invest in the public health infrastructure. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. One of the things uh, that we have seen with COVID-19 and the pandemic is the need uh, to hear voices in our communities of color and our marginalized communities. Can you speak to the need of elevating the voices of BIPOC members in both uh, healthcare and research and public health? Absolutely. Um, ironically, this is sort of connected to the first response and to the first question. Um, just as we have squandered opportunities to support um, healthcare systems and the public health infrastructure, we've also squandered the opportunity to include other voices into the solution. Um, as you see now, as we deal with COVID-19, there's a lot of politicization of COVID-19 in terms of how it's handled at the federal level, um, at the state level and local levels. And the politics have sort of um, created a situation where people are um, excluded or it's not an inclusive conversation. Um, so the science is being ignored particularly. And then that's further exacerbated or further um, underscored when we're not taking into consideration the science to sort of move this pandemic, move the needle in this pandemic in a favorable position or um, mitigate or cure or rehabilitate some of the impact that the pandemic has had on us. We also have not included those voices of the black and brown researchers and scientists who also contribute to this um, area of public health, public health science, epidemiology, um, uh, virology, as well as immunology. 
So when you exclude those voices, it's impossible to actually have any credible or substantive impact on addressing the issue at hand. Um, it's like if you're if you're trying to move any need on equity, whether it's health equity or any other type of equity, such as education, you have to have the voices of those individuals who are um, bearing the disproportionate brunt of the um, of the matter at hand. And usually those people are the black, brown, and the poor. So if they're not involved in the entire bench of your organization or your movement or your drive, you will never really have any substantive impact. So with that said, the um, black and brown or the BIPOC community of scientists and researchers, they really need to be involved in the response to this um, from the beginning to the end and have to be consistently involved in the public health infrastructure, even when there isn't a pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. Next, I'd like to ask Kate Wells, my co-chair in the Oregon Committee for Health Equity, to share her perspectives as a health policy and business leader. Thank you, Dr. de Vivier. Um, I'm happy to do so. Um, and I thought what I could do is really share a little perspective as a as sort of a boots on the ground person that works at both the system and a community level. Um, on how equity work can be advanced by taking into account regional differences. Um, again, I think I've already heard it said once here, one size does not fit all, um, and that is particularly true with the communities that we work in. As a framework, I'll be referring to four Ps, purpose, people, process, and policy. Um, first, a bit about Pacific Source. Um, we have a four-state put footprint of commercial and Medicare across Oregon, Idaho, Washington, and Montana. And in the state of Oregon, we cover 267,000 lives in Medicaid in four what we call coordinated care organization regions um, in the state, including a small share of the health share coordinated care organization in the Portland metro market. So we'll start with purpose. As a system level entity, we have the responsibility in our position to ensure equitable access to health care as well as advance overall community health. We do this work by really advancing on principles that are important to us and important to the work in general, which is being community centered, listening to our community, and taking a very collaborative approach. Um, Values are extremely important in the work that we do. Values establish a shared purpose, not only within our organ own organization to rally everyone around a shared purpose, but also into the communities we served. We have a value that is dedicated to equity, and I'll just read it. We actively work to advance social justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in our workplace, the healthcare system, and community. So now we'll move on to people. Our values definitely set the, sta the, the stage and the table for the work that we know can't be underdone or undertaken in a vacuum. So we really have a lot of focus on our workforce. We look at workforce um, strengthening and workforce development, both in our own workforce as a CCO, but also in our provider networks. Um, so we fo have a lot of focus on um, supporting around diversity recruitment, retention, promotion practices, um, as well as cultural responsivity training and cultural competency training to ensure that our partners and our own workforce is equipped with the tools they need to best serve our members. Process. Um, as a health insurance organization, we are we are definitely driven by data and evidence. Um, we um, have access to a lot of different data sources, not only our own claims and utilization data, but data from publicly available data sources as well. Um, and where we really see some regional variations is around um, languages spoken and demographics, as well as health factors. So not only. Um, demographics and language, but also um, social and economic factors, healthcare access factors. Um, and just by way of example, um, I'm going to just sort of do a contrast in our Central Oregon Coordinated Care Organization, which consists of Deschutes, Jefferson, and Crook counties. Um, Jefferson County is um, considered one of our most medically underserved regions as compared with Deschutes County, which is more highly resourced. Um, as a result, to this lack of access and other social barriers like lack of transportation, housing, food insecurity, we see higher rates of emergency department utilization in that community. Uh, the slide that they're going to show on the screen, that we're showing on the screen, um, is what we use from the Robert Wood Johnson County Health Rankings, which is one of the publicly available data sources that we use to really um, help us round out not only what's happening um, from a healthcare claims and utilizations perspective, but what are some of the community characteristics um, that are impacting community health. As this sh slide shows, um, when you look at health outcomes that include 
length of life and quality of life, as well as health factors that include social factors and economic factors and healthcare access. There is a stark contrast between these three regions that are just exist within one coordinated care organization, with the Schutz County coming in at fifth. Um, a high five um, statewide, and Jefferson County coming in as one of the lowest ranked um, counties in the state at 34th. Finally, we, um, with our data and doing our, um, using our data to really um, do some community assessment with our community partners, we're really also focused on using those data and creating community health improvement plans that really center on community engagement. It is very important, as Dr. Franklin has mentioned, to bring people in who are, who are served um, and have um, disproportionate impact in terms of health disparities or inequities that they face in our systems to have a voice in systems transformation. So we work with agencies and organizations that represent underserved communities and communities of color, and we work to tailor our plans to um, address the needs that are unique to each community that we serve. Finally, policy. Policy is absolutely critical, as it's the underpinning that ensures continued focus on equity work. Policy sets the rules of the road. <clears throat> if you're seeing this graphic now, you'll see there's a man behind the desk, which could represent a system that was designed for a dominant culture. Without equity-centered policies, those, um, those players in this, in this, in this quiz or game or test, if you will, will always be at a disadvantage. So policies have the power to ensure everyone has a fair chance, giving the elephant wings, for example, um, or in our case, ensuring cultural, linguistic, and social factors that put people at a disadvantage are addressed. One of the frameworks that we use um, to establish policy uh, in multiple areas in healthcare are the National Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Services Standards. These standards ensure healthcare organizations provide effective, equitable, understandable, and respectful quality of care, and that services are responsive to diverse cultural health beliefs, practices, preferred languages, health literacy, and other communication needs. So with all of this experience um, and a perspective as, um, with these regional variations from a statewide level, we also work to actively um, work on statewide policy that builds on these themes um, that may be regional variations, but also common things that we see across all of our systems. In closing, system reforms is multifaceted. We need to be grounded in purpose, invest in our people, be deliberate about process and recognize that we cannot sustain this work without a progressive policy at all levels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Kate. Also joining us today is Rakaya Adams. Rakaya, as the Chief Investment Officer of Meyer Memorial Trust, one of the Northwest's largest charitable foundations, what can you tell us about the economic and financial consequences of health inequities? Thank you, Dr. DeVoe. It's so nice to be here with you all. I can see that um, my work and life are quite different than all of yours, so I'll, I'll probably see the world a little, little bit differently. And I wanna thank you for open, opening up a conversation about health equity and including uh, components of the economic consequences of it, because we're in this really important moment of interrogating what America is becoming. Before I say more, I would like to openly say that some of my language may be jarring in its directness, but I think it's necessary in order for us to get to understanding, to say with words what we mean. Uh, in particular, in states like Oregon with a relatively large white population, uh, if we don't look at race and look at disaggregated, disaggregated data, we assume that whole parts of the state are homogenous, right? And that their health needs are monolithic. And that's actually not true. Uh, when we avoid discussions about race, uh, we, we erase some of the most important priorities throughout the state that are actually in our rural um, communities, uh, not in cities. Um, we have to get comfortable being uncomfortable in this conversation in order to break through to get to a more equitable society. Um, our topic today, health equity, which I, is important, but it's kind of odd to have an investor talking about it, but I want to talk about why it's, it's not odd. In my role as an investor, I think of my job as making money for the people without being a total jerk. And in order to do that, I see lots of data, and we aggregate that data to form opinions about trends and opportunity. As I read health metrics and patient care, that many of you health providers think of as single transactions between a doctor and a patient, what I do is roll that information up 
into uh, consolidated uh, data that helps me see where there are big challenges. Uh, my view then is more longitudinal, so it's not just a patient or public health, which is lateral aggregation, but longitudinal ag aggregation, meaning what happens to the baby that is born 25 years later? How do they contribute to economic vitality of, of the region? Um, so uh, one of the big topics that I think a, a lot about is uh, maternal health and, and newborn health. Um, babies born in 2020 will help us solve some of the most pressing problems in 2045. Um, they will help us solve the chemistry challenge of climate change and vaccine development. Uh, they'll help us uh, with uh, the physics problem of energy storage, which is a massive economic issue for us. Um, we hope that babies born today will help us solve the biological problem of feeding more humans with less land, waste, and water. So maternal health and newborn health for me are long-term investment assets. Uh, they're the drivers of tomorrow's um, economies. And when you think about health disparities, we really, and, and maternal health, um, the impact of small improvements on maternal and infant health have huge impacts in our economy. Uh, one good example is that uh, black women uh, experience maternal fatality or mortality at a level that's three times higher than white women. The effect of that on our economy directly isn't that large because there aren't that many live births for black women in the United States and certainly not in a state, a state like Oregon. But what we have found in our economic analysis is that um, uh, child mortality performance or numbers are key determinants of GDP growth. For every 1% decline in child mortality, we have a 5% boost in GDP, which means, and that's a proxy for a number of other societal and, pro and community problems, but essentially, if we do better by mothers and babies, the next 20 or 25 years, our economies will be more dynamic. Um, and, and that's a really interesting point because African-American babies suffer mortality at a rate that's three times that of, of white babies, and Native American and Latino babies are somewhere in between. So if we could make black infant mortality about the same as white infant mortality, in, or, in other words, improve the outcomes for black children, our GDP would get a 2.5% boost. And 2.5% on the United States GDP in 2018, it, our GDP was $21 trillion. So 2.5% of that is half, you know, $500 billion. That's a lot of money. In a state like Oregon, our demographic attribution would be something like $7 billion. That's $1,750 per citizen. That's more than all of the COVID uh, stimulus paid out to citizens of the state of Oregon just in one year if we can improve it. And even if this indicator is imprecise and it's off and we only get half of that benefit for our economy in 20 years, that's still $250 billion of increased economic activity in the country. We need to face some of these health inequities because they drive economic consequences for all of us. When I look around Portland, I'm a fourth generation Portlander, I can see the economic effect of health inequity. The way that I see it is with lifelong complications or um, pre-existing conditions that were fully present, uh, preventable in some cases for black women, hypertension, heart problems. So these are issues that are not just related to birth, but over the lifespan of, of the mother. And we see with children, elevated stress levels during pregnancy cause a number of consequences to uh, the person after they're born, including asthma and some other lifelong challenges that impair economic, um, impair economic uh, productivity. So when we think about the health differences, I see them in our schools that are underfunded because the health, the, the GDP consequences are not felt evenly across the population. They're concentrated in those, in those communities that need it the most, right? I see it in deferred maintenance on um, people's homes. I see it in um, uh, shortened lifespans, which are a form of wealth inequity. Um, so as we think about health equity, I challenge the health providers to think about themselves as a part of our broader economic system.
And from time to time, as we think about health equity as a component of the social determinants of health, let's turn that concept on its head. And maybe what we're dealing with are the health determinants of economic vitality. I look forward to learning more and contributing my thoughts to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much to all three of our panelists. You've given us a lot to think about. So now I'd like to open up our question and answer portion where we will ask our panelists to respond to questions we've received from audience members. Many of these questions were submitted during the registration for this event. We received a number of questions and we will try to get through a few of them today. Many of the other questions will certainly inform future events that we will have. So the first question, and again, I'd love to hear from all of our panelists, but we'll start with you, Rakaya, as a legal professional. This question is, do you see medical legal partnerships as an effective tool to address social determinants of health and promote health equity? And if so, how? Absolutely. So legal medical partnerships allow patients to receive both the care that their body needs, their bodies need to heal, and the kind of uh, uh, accompaniment in our legal structures that will allow them to get the care that they need and perhaps unlock other resources that will help their healing process. So I'm really excited about this intersection of the law, intentional intersection of the law and uh, medicine for the benefit of the patient, not just in antagonistic, you know, sort of legal disputes, but how can we actually be, how can lawyers be Sherpas through the health process and the healing process. I think that would be really exciting and, and, I, and I can't imagine that we wouldn't devote more resources to those kinds of programs. Great, thank you, Rikaya. Uh, Dr. Franklin, a uh, question for you. How do we destigmatize healthcare for BIPOC members of our community? Any thoughts behind that? Sure, I, th um, I think one of the sort of um, root sources of stigmatization and to help remove that destigma and help to remove that stigmatization is to again um, not just um, as I spoke to around BIPOC scientists or researchers but also having um, those individuals in the community a part of the process from beginning to end um, and I, I can't say it enough I had given a talk to um, I think it was the Oregon Dental Association here in Portland, um, and one of the questions came up, uh, sort of around similar to this: How do we, how do we integrate or remove um, the stigmatization associated with um, our efforts in um, in providing uh, health care or um, advancing health equity? And one of the things that I noticed um, in the health professions, but I'm sure there are probably in other professions, uh, the paraprofessionals are often the individuals who, um, the black and the brown individuals who are a part of the organization are often the paraprofessionals. Or there's this idea, particularly in, when we think about medical practice and medical training, we send students, medical students, into the neighborhood to sort of get a better understanding and a grounding of um, the needs and the narratives of the individuals who are disproportionately impacted. However, I think a, a, a more, a better approach, particularly with a more long-term vision and a long-term gain, is to why not have those individuals a part of the system? So in this case, instead of sending out the, the white medical student to the um, African-American or the black and brown neighborhoods, how do we incorporate and sustain having more black and brown individuals in the medical schools? in the medical professions, not only as practitioners, but also as um, executives. Um, we have to not just allow um, those individuals to sit at the little table, if you will. They really have to be a part, again, of the entire organization to sort of help educate and bring that perspective to um, remove what is seen as stigmatization, um, but often it's a lack of understanding and a lack of engagement, ongoing engagement with those communities that you're trying to impact. Um, so I, it's again sort of making sure that your, brent, your bench is strong, it is broad, and it's consistent with the voices um, of the individuals that you purport or that's purported that we want to improve um, their outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. <laughs> 
Uh, here's another question that came in, and Kate, I'll send this one over to you. This is from someone who says, as a white person of privilege, can you provide some tips on allyship? How can I use privilege to amplify BIPOC voices? <clears throat> it's a great question. Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind with that is um, passion and endurance. Um, endurance is um, extremely important, but also um, working with the communities to, to, to gather stories and, and find out the best way to move some of those messages forward. Uh, I can just give an example of a project I did um, sort of in a previous role. Um, we wanted to get at trying to understand um, where the health system was falling short for our Latinx communities and, com and Native American communities in the Central Oregon region. And we used a project um, that we, they helped um, those communities um, through engagement, um, through our Health Equity Coalition helped us develop, which is called Multicultural Storytelling. Um, and we were able to sort of gather stories um, and, and share those stories with some of the governing boards um, in the region uh, that really um, needed to hear where some of those barriers are. And I'll just share off the top of my head one story. Um, we had um, a, a Latina gal who um, had to go in for an emergency surgery, a very stressful, traumatic sur surgery. She spoke perfect English, um, but her husband um, spoke very little English. Uh, and in that experience, um, because she spoke perfect English, and this was several, several years ago, um, uh, she, her husband ended up, ha or she had ended up having to translate for her husband during the entire process. Um, being able to use that, that community engagement technique and then bring a story like that forward to a governing board to elevate that voice um, was extremely powerful. Um, and so I think it's a combination of endurance, working with the communities, understanding what messages need to be brought forward, and then using techniques that really drive those messages home are super important. Thank you. Great, thank you. So um, a very broad question that I would uh, happy to just open up to the entire panel. So um, what actions have been made to provide health equity for people of all backgrounds? How do we solve health disparities amongst different communities? Um, can we, any input or how we can, you know, unpack that question there? Well, I have a point of view from the community level. So the, the first bit of insight is that for communities of color, a top-down approach with institutions telling them what health equity is and what the solutions are that doesn't work. What we're seeing in the response to COVID is a bubbling up from the community level of um, a, a point of view about how to take care of us and how to include data about our health and the transmission uh, of the virus in our communities and how we might share information out. So the first step, I think, in achieving health equity is to encourage leadership in all communities and communities of color to uh, support the um, elevation of of active voices that are not medical voices. So the kinds of people in communities who connect with people, whether it's through churches or grocery stores, and to aggregate that information and take it seriously. When we design studies about COVID, for example, or about general public health. Um, so I, I'm seeing a really exciting movement that is leadership based, that is bubbling up from the community level to meet the resources available from institutions. But, but the old view that the answers will come from um, even our most treasured institutions like OHSU, um, that's probably not true. It's gonna take a combination of the technical experience and resources meeting the community leadership and connections in order to improve health for everybody. Any, any uh, insight into some barriers to achieving health equity? I would say one of the barriers that I, I often come up against or I notice is the actual framing of the issue at hand. I think how it's framed um, is the code or dictates sort of how it's addressed. So often people, when you start talking about health equity or race and um, race equity, uh, people say it's, it's so big, right? I, I can't, like, you know, how do we get rid of racism? How do we 
it's so large, how do I manage it? And I, and I think, um, although that's a reasonable way, and I understand how that approach can be overwhelming, however, I think it's more important to look at acknowledging the narratives of the people who are experiencing this. And we, in many ways, we are doing health equity, but, it's, but the framing shapes who gets the, that experience. So for example, as a, um, as a way to sort of address the opioid epidemic, we've come up, we've gotten very creative with the different methods to sort of um, sustain life with uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the buprenorphine um, um, shots to sort of prevent um, um, overdose, react, overdose activities. We've created different drugs that people could take at their home to help support fighting the addiction as, as opposed to going out to a methadone clinic. So essentially, the way we've addressed um, and of late years, the opioid epidemic, we've met the narrative where it was. We've met the narrative of the people who are experiencing that. And we've created a more equitable way, equitable because it, it identifies their narrative, acknowledges it, and addresses it. Similarly, if the narrative is more about a sort of moral failing, or the framing is about a moral failing, or some type of inherent um, character flaw, you often get a response, or that's a code for a different type of response. Um, so we know how to do health equity because we're doing it for some groups. Right? So it's, it's not as a, um, a Sisyphean or insurmountable task as I think most people sort of um, um, internalize it. So we're doing it, but if we meet the people who are experiencing the issue, meet their narrative to where it is, hearing their voices from the ground up, and acknowledge it, identify it, acknowledge it, and address it accordingly, that is health equity. And so the framing often gets in the way of, um, or is a huge barrier from the beginning to the end. Dr. Franklin, I'd like to add a little bit to that. Um, one other barrier, I think, for um, the community that I grew up in Northeast Portland is the perceptions of the role of the intermediary institutions, even OHSU. Some people look at the hospital and think that it is aspirational and excellent, and some people might feel excluded and so thinking about hospital systems, clinics as intermediaries between the practitioner and the patient, and those, those systems of intermediation sometimes cause problems. And so we really need to think about what the symbols and the intermediaries represent for the people who need more equitable access and that we might not share the same values um, or the same perception of the institutions. So really chipping away at some of the, the assumptions about whether what is valued, how it's valued, how it's perceived. And, and a lot of that um, understanding will open up, I think, m much more collaboration and engagement. I might just add one other thing, which I spoke to a little bit before, which is um, um, Organizations, communities, institutions can have the best intention to address health equity, but in the absence of explicit policies um, and explicit actions that put into place those particular structures that enable health equity work, um, it feels um, the work doesn't get to advance as far as it probably should. Thank you. Thanks. There's another question here that gets at another intermediary that facilitates or perhaps um, puts up a barrier to obtaining health care services, and that's our health insurance system. So one of our listeners asked, if we don't have a single payer system, how can we ever completely eliminate health disparities when the same care would never be offered or available to everyone? And I think that addresses some of what you were talking about in your remarks, Kate, about what your organization's doing and Rakaya related to the intermediaries between the communities and the patients and their healthcare providers. Any thoughts on how we can improve our health insurance system and ensure that it is a facilitator? I have some thoughts, but I'm, I'm, yeah. uh, again, as someone who's not engaged in the provision of health or in healthcare intermediation, the, the providers and the plans have a lot of data, right? The, and, and that data is available for analysis, and it can probably provide clear indications of where there are gaps in quality and access. And until those institutions are um, 
encouraged to think about their data uh, as a tool in solving some of the health equity issues, I think we'll continue to have this problem. So my, my thinking is that we think about data for improving care, but I wonder if we can also think about the various pools of data for the purpose of identifying and eliminating um, imbalances in access and quality. Um, and, and that there, that in some ways we could incent our uh, plans to share that information and to use it to improve it. And we can incent them financially. Um, of course, I'm someone who thinks in those terms, but um, I can see a number of ways that improving health equity using um, uh, pr um, insurance company data could, could really drive big improvements. Um, but that won't happen if we don't actually look at the data and use it for this purpose. And one thing I might just add there is um, the the Medicaid o organ health plan delivery system model is um, it's a single payer system for the delivery of Medicaid services with different entities that are managing that care. Um, and data is a huge piece of um, of the work that we do. And we do look at quality measures and um, ensure, and these are publicly available data uh, as well. I think that is an absolutely great point. I think we're, we're doing that well here for, for our Medicaid line of business. But if we could start looking at that more broadly, um, that would be um, a really good um, resource for, for equity work. I think it's also important to sort of pull apart the question a little bit. I mean, the question really is sort of, um, it's two parts. It, it, it interrogates the idea of um, quality, right? Because you could have a single payer system with poor quality and you still have poor outcomes. So it's a question of quality, whether a single payer system or not. And then the second question is sort of, um, that, that, the, that the question as it's written implies that the single payer system is probably a, um, maybe a silver bullet, or it gets conceptualized as a silver bullet to health equity. And I think a more appropriate way to look at the question perhaps is not whether or not a single payer system can be a silver bullet, but can we achieve health equity in the absence of having a single payer system in addition to the other types of systems, which we're actively doing already as a country. I mean, you think about the veterans affairs systems, health systems, that is a single payer system. The Medicaid system, the Medicare systems, those are types of single payer systems. Um, and they have coexisted um, and um, in conjunction with commercial um, health care services or the, those, co or those people who uh, are purveyors of commercial health care um, plans. So um, it's not whether or not the, the single payer system will make everything um, okay, but can we, can we advance towards health equity in the absence of having a larger type of single payer system as an option in the menu of options that we have or that we offer to, to our citizens. And I would say that um, we, we can't move forward without giving more thoughtful, intentional consideration of having a single payer system um, for those people who are not a part of the Veterans Administration, who are not Medicaid eligible or um, uh, Medicare eligible. This is a really interesting topic. Um, from where I sit saying by definition, by having something that is not single payer that we have inequity or the disparity, that, that is by definition what I think the question is interrogating. But I think that question is pushing us into what is the American moment right now where we're wrestling with this issue of um, common standards and opportunities, whether it's in education, in public safety, in clean air. <clears throat> We're wrestling with this single payer versus multi payer concept in virtually every component of American life. And what's exciting about having the discussion in health is that we're actually having the discussion, right? Um, we know that, uh, that we're not providing clean water, for example, in some parts of the state near Madras and, and some of our indigenous populations struggle to have access to water. And so people will ask, don't we have a single, single water system? Don't we have a, a, a standard for, um, for, the, uh, for, the, for water as a, as a human right or natural resource? And the answer is no. So we're wrestling with this issue all around and it's exciting to see that our medical professionals are actually pushing it along further, I think, than in some other areas. So I guess the upside of the conversation is that it, it, it's a part of the American zeitgeist right now, but more than anything, the, 
the, the physicians and the healthcare providers are pushing us to think in other areas about how we might follow your lead in thinking about single payer, uh, the single payer construct. Great. Thanks. Um, I think that leads into another question, and I like um, you're posing it as there being multidisciplinary collaborative teams of medical professionals and legal professionals and financial professionals and others within the community. Um, really focused on this, and one example was in Flint, Michigan. It was a pediatrician that identified there was lead in the water, but certainly it took a large group of people to really work on that issue. And so this question um, frame, is framed around whose role is it to address health equity? And I think you've somewhat answered it, but do you have other thoughts on who should be playing a role and coming together to address health equity? Well, I think it's a multi-sector um, approach because um, Equity isn't isn't just access access to health care. It's it's a combination of systems that confound together to produce um, the ultimate adverse outcomes for certain populations. And so it really does take a multi sector approach. Um, it takes initiatives that look at um, advocacy and policy change. Um, it takes initiatives that look at identifying um, a particular equity um, issue that's um, particular to a certain community and um, bringing together people from all different backgrounds um, and, and sectors to address that. Um, so I think, I think it's, um, it's kind of an all, all, all systems on deck uh, proposition. I agree with that. I might add that health equity, I think a lot like democracy sounds like a noun, but it really is a verb, and that it's gonna take constant work and commitment from lots of folks in the community to, to, to achieve. The, the other thought I have is that in these times of COVID that we're acutely aware of how connected we are, how connected our health is, that my health is not really that much better than the person in our community that doesn't have uh, access, quality access or care, right? So the the, the, the responsibility is one that we have to commit to consistently and that we have to commit to together. And, and, and that's the feeling I'm starting to have about it, that it's, it's not something that we can expect our medical providers to solve, that it, this is actually a social issue. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> So we're going to move to, to one, uh, our, our last question. And uh, from your perspective, from your fields, can you uh, help um, identify what OHSU specifically can do to improve health equity for Oregonians? Well, uh, from my perspective as an epidemiologist, and this, was, this is going to be really obviously biased from where I sit as an epidemiologist. That's why I paused. I was like, oh, wow, this is not going to be very broad. But where I, where I sit as an epidemiologist and, and, and as a, not only as a researcher, and, but as a practitioner in the health department or in the public health setting, I am, one of the things um, I think it's important is for the universities and, and to have more of a um, an active um, partnership with the local public health departments, right? Um, I think it happens sort of on the ground just because colleagues know one, each other, know one another and we connect and we, we collaborate, but there isn't a sort of um, a structure in place to offer this um, mutual exchange of, of um, practice and, and knowledge in producing the um, epidemiologists of the future, right, the health professionals of the future, and to get that on the ground experience, but also for the public health department to sort of have access to some of the um, a broader set of colleagues, because sometimes colleagues in the public health setting, we can feel a little disconnected if you don't have, everyone doesn't always have academic or a faculty partnership with other universities, but how do we um, support that exchange between um, the practitioners, the students, and even the, um, the bureaucracies in which we work in, right? I think there's a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of mischaracterization, and um, misinformation about the narratives of, of how this work gets done, how it's supported, um, and again, giving voice to those people who actually do the work. Um, so um, I, for me, I would like to see, not just here in you know, OHSU and Portland, but you know, I've been around a little bit, and, it, and there's never really a formal collaboration um, create, similar to what we do with um, uh, medical schools and um, teaching hospitals, right? 
the, the same thing with uh, public health, um, offices of public health or departments of public health, those two can be teaching grounds um, for students, practitioners, and the bureaucracy or, or the administrators of how to move this work forward. Keep it close enough to the ground, not only to sort of identify the problems, but keep it close enough to, to the ground to get some of the resolutions from the ground up and move it, move it forward. So I, I would love to see more of a um, formalized structure between academic institutions, schools of public health, schools of medicine, with their um, public health departments or the health departments in general. Great. Thank you. One of the issues we, we hear over and over is the lack of diversity in our healthcare workforce. Mm -hmm. um, as a teaching institution, um, it seems, and, and OHSU is probably already putting a lot of thought or does a lot of this work already, but how can we, um, how can we develop strategies that um, improve the diversity in workforce, not only in our urban areas, but in our um, more rural areas as well, where we know we have um, you know, Spanish-speaking populations or other populations um, um, that could be served uh, through more diversity. Um, that, that just comes top to mind. Uh, it just seems like that would be a good uh, fit for OHSU. Thank you. I would add that I, I hope that more of our health providers pivot to the outside communities that they serve and not just have a pull model where they want people to come into the hospitals or the clinics, mm -hmm. but really have a push model where the professionals get out and, and participate in community-based organizations um, and develop social, strong social networks with folks who connect with communities through community-based organizations. So I really would say just pivot to the outside world because the provision of health is not just the service of the body, but the, but the community corpus. Um, and, and that would, I think, be a, a great help to all of us. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists and our audience members for joining us today for this important conversation. Please note today's presentation was recorded and will be available for viewing on the OHSU Foundation website in the near future. We hope you'll join us for a future symposia in this new series on health equity. Our next symposium will be in December. Before we close, I invite you to please share your feedback on today's presentation. You will see on the screen a link to our quick feedback survey. We would very much appreciate you taking a couple of minutes to share your thoughts on today's presentation. We will email this survey link to those who pre-registered. With that, this concludes our event. Thank you for participating and have a wonderful day.